One of the remarkable characteristics about the nature of God is an attribute we call immutability. Now that's a long word, but immutability simply means God doesn't change. In other words, God says what he means, and he does what he says. Now, if you remember back in 1 Kings, the prophet Elijah had pronounced judgment on the house of Ahab and Jezebel because they had led Israel into the idolatrous worship of Baal. They had added uh, to their evil deeds the cold-blooded murder of Naboth so they could steal his little vineyard. Well, in chapter 21 of 1 Kings, Elijah prophesied that Ahab's dynasty would come to a violent end. Every male descendant of his would die. Elijah also announced that Ahab would die himself a bloody death and that his wife Jezebel would be eaten by dogs after she died. Well, by the time we get to chapter 9 in the book of 2 Kings, Ahab has long since died, but Jezebel is still alive. Her son Joram is now the king of Israel, and he's carrying on the evil legacy of his parents. Now, in our last study, we left King Joram in Jezreel, where he's recovering from wounds suffered in a battle. His nephew, Ahaziah, the king of Judah, has come to visit him in Jezreel. God's judgment on them both is about to take place. You see, God has not changed his mind. He is immutable. His word always comes true. Chapter 9 now begins with Elisha appointing a young prophet to go over to Jehu, one of Israel's military commanders. See, Elisha wants him to anoint Jehu king over Israel. So verse 6 tells us here, The young prophet poured the oil on Jehu's head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anoint you king over the people of the Lord over Israel, and you shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets. Well, after this takes place, Jehu's fellow soldiers proclaim their allegiance to him as the new king. But there's this little problem. You see, King Joram, is he's still alive, so he's still the king. Well, this newly appointed King Jehu is going to ride over to Jezreel and take care of this little problem. So as Jehu approaches, verse 20 says he is driving furiously. King Joram is notified. Well, Joram gets in his chariot and rides out to meet Jehu along with Judah's king, Ahaziah. So you see what God's doing providentially. He's arranging that they all happen to meet up together, and would you believe it, at the site of Naboth's vineyard. Well, when Joram asks if Jehu's come in peace, Jehu answers here in verse 22, What peace can there be so long as the whorings and the sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Jehu then draws his bow and sends an arrow straight through the heart of King Joram. Well, Jehu tells his military aide here in verse 25, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth the Jezreelite. For remember, When you and I rode side by side behind Ahab, his father, how the Lord made this pronouncement against him, as surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. Well, with this, God's word has come true. Now, King Ahaziah of Judah finds himself in Jehu's crosshairs, and Ahaziah is hit with an arrow as well, but he manages to get away. Well, over in the parallel account of 2 Chronicles chapter 22 and verses 7 and 9, we learn that he actually makes it all the way to Samaria and then later to Megiddo where he dies. Well, Jehu now takes off for the city of Jezreel, where Jezebel is still living. She's up in a tower of some sort, and she looks down and defiantly taunts Jehu. 
Well, on his command, servants throw her from that upper window, and she dies immediately upon impact. And just as God said years earlier, back in 1 Kings chapter 21, wild dogs just sort of show up and consume her body before she can even be buried. Well, if that isn't enough you know, bloodshed for one Wisdom Journey program, there remains the prophecy regarding all the other wicked members of Ahab's family. So the killing is going to continue back here now in 2 Kings in chapter 10. Seventy sons of Ahab are living in Samaria, and Jehu orders them all put to death. So they face the firing squad, so to speak. Jehu's still not finished. Verse 18, all the way down here through the end of chapter 10, tells us that Jehu now sets in motion a plan to wipe out all the false prophets and worshipers of Baal. So he invites them all to join him here in verse 19, saying, Call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his worshipers, all his priests, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal. The author adds here in a parenthesis, however, Jehu did it with cunning in order to destroy the worshipers of Baal. Well, when they all gather here in the temple of Baal, Jehu sends in his men to destroy them all. We're told here in verse 28, Jehu wiped out Baal or Baal worship from Israel. I mean, he just cleaned it out of the nation Israel. He he effectively carries out God's judgment in cleansing Israel of all this false worship. And God commends him here in verse 30, saying to him here, because you've done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. Now, it'd be wonderful if, if, you know, we could read that Jehu went on to serve the Lord faithfully and his biography ended with that, but that isn't the case at all. We're told here in verse 29, Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin. That is, the golden calves that were in Bethel and in Dan. It's sad to say, but Jehu was more capable of wiping out the followers of Baal than in leading the people to follow God. As one author put it, Jehu was more of an instrument than a servant of God, spiritually incapable of promoting the true worship of Israel's God. For the next 25-plus years, Jehu's going to reign as king of Israel, but his reign is going to be marked by conflict and defeat and ultimately humiliation. Now, our study today through these two chapters of, you know, they've been a lot like the way Jehu drove his chariot. It's been a rather wild ride. But there are some lessons we need to learn, and they're going to impact our lives to this very day. So we need to slow down for for just a moment. First, don't be deceived. Sin has consequences, even if some of those consequences are delayed for years. And by the way, even forgiven sins can have lasting consequences in our own lives. We we thank God for his forgiveness, but we ought to take warning from Jehu's biography here in verse 31 where we read, Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. The second lesson would be this. Don't be discouraged. Sin can be forgiven immediately, even though consequences may linger. Let's allow those consequences to continually draw us to depend on the strength and grace of God. And remember, God's plans always come to pass. Even sinful actions are fit into a sovereign plan. The unchanging word of God never fails. That means the promises of God never fail. His promises of forgiveness, salvation, direction, grace, mercy, his promise of a future home in heaven as a gift of grace. Well, that's going to come to pass as well one day. Now, in the meantime, let's continue walking, not like Jehu, 
but with our whole heart. Let's walk on this journey of wisdom, wisdom we're gleaning from God's unchanging word. Well, now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Amen.